Hi, everybody. My name is Cindy Crum, and I'm the CEO of Mobile Moxie based in Denver, Colorado. We are a mobile SEO and app SEO tool company as well as a consultancy. So we help companies of all sizes optimize rankings for uh, their mobile websites and mobile apps. Uh, I'm excited to be talking to you today, giving you a presentation that was originally given in Portland at a conference called Engage. Uh, and this is a a uh, redo of that presentation so that it can be shared on the web. So this talk is called Mobile First Indexing, the story that your data isn't telling you. Uh, and I want to start with this pretty picture uh, by telling you that uh, even though it seems amazing, saying that you're a data-driven marketer uh, might not be enough in SEO anymore because I feel like uh, I think what you'll see in this presentation is a lot of data-driven marketers are missing some very important numbers that are causing them to make decisions that might not be in their best interest. But before we get into that, let's start with some facts about ostriches, just what we needed in Portland first thing in the morning. Uh, so in general, uh, we know that ostriches are flightless birds. So what happens when a flightless bird gets scared? Well, either they run like crazy or sometimes they hide. And sometimes they hide like this. And what you can't see, let's see, is that this ostrich is uh, has his head in the sand and is watching a TV with a picture of a bird flying on it. So sometimes they run, sometimes they hide, sometimes they hide creatively and try and learn new skills. And I feel like this is a good analogy for what's happening with a lot of SEOs, because SEOs do this, too. Uh, and usually they're not alone. They're uh, doing it with others, uh, reassuring everyone that everyone's doing a great job with their SEO and that everything's OK. And if they're doing anything with their heads under the sand, it's staring at their analytics. But what happens if the analytics that people are using, that SEOs especially are using, to make all of their decisions aren't giving you the full story? Uh, if they don't have all the data, then that leads to bad results, right? Incomplete data, incomplete or bad decision making. And that's a problem. But the other problem is this, and that is sometimes the data just doesn't make sense. And I feel like all SEOs have been in this position where they're looking at something crazy uh, in their analytics or in Search Console that shows something like this where uh, total clicks uh, fell off the map right at the same time that the average position uh, improved quite a bit. And this doesn't make any sense at all. But yeah, we're still trying to use normal means to explain it to our bosses, but this is really hard to explain when when crazy stuff like this happens. And the reason I, I have this graph is because at Mobile Moxie, uh, we've been doing SEO and mobile SEO for a very long time. And at this point, we are not working for teams that don't already have in-house SEO on staff. So they have highly skilled, highly capable SEOs who are reading the data and reading the analytics. And the problem is sometimes the analytics and the data just doesn't make sense. And so we're brought in. So we've become kind of the SEOs for SEOs. And so we come in and help with problems when the data doesn't give you all the answers or the data just doesn't make sense. And what we've learned in doing this is that there are some fundamental core ideas that even really great SEOs are missing. So my goal is to share those with you today. Um, so first off, we've focused on mobile since the beginning, and a lot of SEOs still are forgetting that worldwide, and especially in the United States, mobile search represents more than half of the searches. Unfortunately, SEOs, and especially SEO tools, They'll focus heavily on desktop. And so when you're getting data out of the tools, they're focusing on what's ranking in desktop because it's the only thing that they're able to scrape or crawl or do whatever they've historically done. It's always been based on desktop, and most of the tools haven't been rebuilt to understand what's happening, what's ranking in mobile. And so that's not your fault per se, but you need to at least know when you're using a tool what you're looking at, uh, if it's mobile, if it's de desktop, or if it's mixed. 
But the problem is that when tools and SEOs focus heavily on desktop, that causes problems. And this is data that came out of SEM Rush that they haven't published yet. They gave me permission to talk about it at the Engage conference. Uh, but essentially, they did some research on the top 50,000 queries in their tool. And what they found is of those queries, 31% of desktop search results aren't visible in a mobile search result. Only 11% percent uh, keep their position in both mobile and desktop SERPs, and 13 percent of the domains, uh, only 13 percent of domains keep their position. So when it says domain, it may change page, but stay in the same position, but it's not always the same page. And so this level of change, uh, you know, when only 11 percent are the same or only 13 percent are the same, uh, that shows significant change uh, that's not being accounted for if you're only looking at the desktop data. The other thing that we see quite a bit when we're helping companies with SEO is people coming to us uh, during the course of a project and saying, hey, this thing just showed up in the mobile search result. That wasn't there before, was it? It didn't look like that before, did it? What does this mean? Uh, and so, and, and when these things just kind of show up, um, it's hard to know uh, how long have they been there, how long has it been impacting search results, how do we account for it, especially if it's not another blue link that factors into the ranking, but it's something else like a knowledge graph or hosted inclusion or uh, featured snippet, stuff like that. New stuff showing up in the search result takes clicks even if it doesn't take rankings. So this ends up happening a lot for, for stuff like that, where there's like something new in this mobile search result, but I don't know how to quantify it. I don't know how to put it into my data or account for it. So I'm just gonna pretend it's not happening. Uh, unfortunate, because mobile results are changing really drastically. You have all of these new features that are showing up in the search result um, that are driving Clicks, the found on the web is especially big, but all of these videos um, and and things that drive clicks within the search result, but don't drive clicks over to a website. And that's, that's changing fundamentally how SEO works, because what you can see is like we've got a click and then a carousel. But again, the, it's a carousel of featured snippets or answers. So there's just in many cases no reason for someone to click all to a website. And so I want you, the people watching this video, not to be one of the SEOs that just is pretending this stuff isn't happening because it absolutely is and it absolutely is taking clicks and we need to account for it in the way that we're presenting data to internally at our companies or to our clients. And this is possible. I believe in you. You can do it. So understand and kind of break down how we would talk about this with a client, I first need to talk about entity first indexing. And entity first indexing is a concept that we've been talking at, about at Mobile Moxie for a while, uh, but it's related to mobile first indexing. So when mobile first indexing launched, we looked at what was happening and said, hey, yes, it's understood that this is for mobile, but it doesn't seem like it's necessarily just based on the switch to the mobile crawler. What it really seems like is a switch to organizing Google's information based on the knowledge graph or entities in the knowledge graph, rather than just a recrawl of all of the sites. It's a different, more clever organization of the information in the index. And so that's where we get this idea of entity first indexing. So the things in the knowledge graph are entities. Um, and when we talk about entities, sometimes SEOs have a hard time grasping onto the concept, but an entity is a thing that exists and keywords describe that thing. Um, so if we talk about mother, this is the example I give a lot. If we talk about the concept of a mother, uh, a mother is related to a daughter, is related to a son, is related to a father or a grandfather, grandmother. All of those relationships stay the same, regardless of what language we're speaking, what, what language we say mother in. And so this is why I like to talk about entities, because entities happen before keywords and keywords describe entities. And in our research, what we've seen is that Google appears to be building out the knowledge graph around these entity concepts and entity relationships that stay the same, 
even though language changes. And we'll talk about this more later, but it's important to understand that this helps Google tremendously because it allows their machine learning algorithms to be more uh, comprehensive and to share more knowledge across more languages. Historically, Google's um, machine learning models were language-based and keyword-based. And so they could only learn things in one language at a time. And essentially, when you move from one language to another, they had to kind of start over and relearn everything. And that's not how people's brains work. And that's not an efficient way for Google to operate. Because what happened then is they were really strong at fighting spam, for instance, in English and languages where they had a lot of machine learning uh, feedback. But they weren't very good at fighting spam or even surfacing the right results in smaller languages where they had less machine learning feedback because they had less people who spoke the language, less people searching in the language, fewer people in, in the language. And they weren't able to take what they knew in one language and cross apply it to the other languages. So this model, this entity first indexing model is hugely valuable for Google because it means they can get up to speed and share what they know in one language across even the languages that are very small that they're not very good at. And so that's why they would want to do entity first indexing. It helps with mobile in some ways, um, but it's more about helping them grow faster and more smart, smartly, more intelligently um, in a way that's sustainable and scalable uh, and, and just more efficient. Now, when we talk about entity first indexing, uh, Further throughout the rest of this presentation, what we're going to be talking about is hosted inclusions. And hosted inclusions are things that we're seeing more and more of that um, seem to be vignettes into the knowledge graph. So in our understanding of the world, in SEO anyway, we tend to see kind of two different kinds of rankings. We see hosted inclusions, they're coming from the knowledge graph, and then blue links. And most sites, any ranking, anything in a search result is either one or the other, or paid. That's separate things. I guess there are two things. But from an organic perspective, it's either hosted inclusions from the knowledge graph or blue links. And there's sometimes this disambiguation that you see up here at the top where it says, mm, we have multiple knowledge graph entries that might be related to that. But that's still knowledge graph. It's just kind of disambiguation within the knowledge graph. Um, and we see a lot of, of this kind of thing happening where knowledge graph is getting built out much more aggressively and more and more things are being added into the knowledge graph so that they can rank or at least be disambiguated, uh, but also more and more host inclusions that aren't just plain knowledge graph but are vignettes into the knowledge graph are starting to show up. Uh, and this is especially true of featured snippets. We believe that featured snippets are kinds of hosted inclusions, aka featured snippets are pieces of the web that have been indexed or organized in the knowledge graph. They're already part of the knowledge graph, and these are showing the most growth. So we've seen a massive growth in featured snippets. Um, and Rob Bucci from STAT wrote an article about this saying that uh, the number of featured snippets in a SERP has grown 6x from August 2018 or from April 2018 to August 2018. And we now have all these different kinds of featured snippets um, where we have uh, things like hybrid featured snippets where it's mixing the text from one website and the image from another. We have uh, double featured snippets where it's showing one stacked upon another, uh, just like that one did. Uh, and that's a huge deal. Uh, and then all these different new kinds or new additions to the featured snippet. Uh, and so that's really important. And we think that that's telling about what Google cares about um, and the direction that they're going. Um, but then the other thing is that uh, we think that there are other new hosted inclusions or things that are showing up in the search result that are also part of the knowledge graph. So this includes things like these interesting finds that have been around. Uh, and sometimes if you're in a specific location, it'll be interesting finds in your area. Um, or it might be um, people also search for questions and expanders. Uh, or it could be uh, these found on the web things are popping up more and more. 
uh, or it could be the Merchant Center introduction of the free organic uh, product carousels that are not, they're like PLAs, but they're free. So in general, what you have to understand is that these different kinds of hosted inclusions are growing in frequency, variety, and functionality, and we don't expect that to change. The other thing that's happening quite a bit that may or may not be part of the knowledge graph is that when there's a ranking with a blue link, you're getting more and more links and sublinks within that one link. So in this case, we have a Wikipedia link, um, and it shows first off the, the link to the class, the order, and the family, but then it also has a carousel of different related uh, topics. So this one's about ostriches, so it links to other kinds of ostriches or subtypes, because this is common ostrich, so now it's like, oh, let's get specific with your ostrich. Uh, but then we also have these kind of answer links or expanders where you get um, a right-facing arrow that you can click through and it'll go to either a specific page or a specific part of a page that answers a question. But you can see if you, ans if you ask a question of the search engine, it's trying to find you multiple uh, related questions and multiple relate help you get to multiple related answers in this. And so where previously this might just be one blue link, we now have uh, at least five links in this one listing. And we're also getting more and more answer carousels with which Rob from Stat also blogged about, but they look like this and they're part of featured snippets where you're getting not just a featured snippet, but other links to other kinds of featured snippets uh, or knowledge graph. And you're, or you're getting the ability to filter in yet yeah, more specific, like you can see on the right, I searched for tall birds and it gives you the featured snippet, but then it gives you the ability to narrow it down, down to tall birds in Florida, and if you were to click, or tall birds in Illinois, and if you were to click on those, you would get a new featured snippet, not go through necessarily to the result. Uh, same thing on the left uh, with tall birds, you're getting the, the carousel from earthrangers.com. I um, mean, this is higher up in the search result, but uh, we can click through on these and go directly to the specific page on Earth Rangers for all of these particular birds. And so these answer carousels are making featured snippets and answers even more rich and compelling as well. So with all of the new featured snippets and things in featured snippets, all of the new hosted inclusions and all of the new links that are included in a search result. Uh, it, it begs the question, what does ranking in position one organic even mean anymore? Uh, because with all of this other stuff happening, position one organic could be halfway down the page. And so it's not gonna drive as much traffic as it used to. And you can't just ignore all of the beautiful, rich, amazing, interactive content that's happening above it. That stuff is gonna take clicks away from position one organic. So as a whole, there are fewer clicks to be had, even if you have always had position one organic for a particular keyword, you're likely going to see decreases in rankings. So look at a case study. If you're an ostrich and you are scared and want to hide, you might want panic room supplies. You might want to stock up your panic room, right? So there are a couple problems if what you're selling is supplies to outfit a panic room. Let's Number one, Panic Room was a movie. And so if you just search for Panic Room, what you're getting is all of the information about the movie. And it goes way, way down, way down. So you're almost, it's, it's about, it's more than halfway down the page until you get to what is a Panic Room, how does a Panic Room work, any information that's actually about a Panic Room and not about the movie. But then if you search for supplies, like for a specific place like Anchorage, what happens is what's ranking is not a panic room, 
but an escape room. So Google's conflated the idea of two things that are actually quite opposite of each other. A panic room is where you go when you're legitimately scared. And an escape room is where you go when you're doing like team building for a company and you want to solve puzzles together. But when you search for panic room Anchorage, what it's showing is a Google My Business listing for the escape room and not the panic room. Put that one again. Panic room supplies Anchorage and it's an escape room. And then the next couple are also escape rooms. So it's conflated these two ideas. It doesn't understand the difference. Then the last thing you can do is search for something specific like panic room supplies. And then you get a featured snippet that kind of makes sense. It shows you pictures of what people stock their panic rooms with. And that's great if we're selling supplies for a panic room. But if we do anything that's less like practical sounding than supplies, like if we do food, uh, and especially if we do something like snacks, which is what I would want in my panic room, uh, it reverts all the way back to uh, thinking that you want an escape room, that it's something fun. Uh, so you have to do a really great job of your SEO if what you sell is panic room supplies. So this is really difficult. So what we wanted to do is find out how often is either the movie or the idea of an escape room, like an actual escape room, impacting our ability to rank in a search result um, in specific places. And we looked at um, a hypothetical client and said, where are they having trouble where they're making sales, but we know that we're not driving as much organic traffic as we should. So we did this test um, using Maxi tool, and we added all of the addresses of where we knew uh, we should be doing better than we were in terms of selling either offline or online, um, and started doing searches for what was blocking us from getting the online traffic that we thought that we deserved. So we saw a lot of these interesting finds. We saw a lot of PPC getting in the way, uh, and, and then we saw big brands like Sam's and Cabela's. And then we did find um, some local offline companies that were ranking uh, for uh, searches like emergency food. That was one that, that worked out well. But in general, what we did is we did these searches and compiled them for the top six cities uh, and the top five keywords that we cared about. And we made a spreadsheet and we showed number one, when was knowledge graph or featured snippet showing up? When was a map pack showing up? Um, and what else was ranking or getting in our way of, of ranking above us? You can see we, we looked uh, and just coded it out. We encoded the data. So we have a line for ads. We have a line for featured snippet and knowledge graph. We have a line for map pack. Um, and then we color coded it by major brands. Uh, so each color represents a different brand. And we actually did it for iOS and Android because sometimes you can see in this first result, sometimes uh, iOS and Android come back with slightly different results, especially for apps. And, and there weren't really apps in this uh, query too much, but we wanted to double check. And so from there, we could give them um, an idea of where they were going to have an easier time ranking uh, and where they were going to have a hard time ranking and then some strategies for dealing with the, the places where they were going to have a hard time. And, and kind of the sneak peek is the places they were going to have a hard time ranking were especially uh, the places that had a high density of uh, escape rooms because the escape room map pack would always show up. So. Essentially, what, what I can say that we found in a lot of this research is that Google is an answer engine now. They're not just a search engine. What they're trying to do is find people the answers that they want rather than just providing a list of links for people to click in to find the answers on their own. And you can see this with the increase in the featured snippets, with the increase in the answer carousels, with the increase in the people also ask. All of these are windowing information from websites without people clicking through to the website. They're showing people answers and snippets of text from the website that they think answers the question that they've asked. Um, and that's kicking a lot of web traffic out of anything that you're measuring. If you're not actually looking at the results, you might not know that uh, these people also ask 
um, inclusions are now ranking right above you and they're getting all the attention because they're expandable and they show the answer right there or anything like that. This having a people also ask um, inclusions show up where you used to rank number one uh, is really tough. It's really bad for organic traffic. So this is a really big problem. Um, but we're seeing it in, in more more instances. How fast can an ostrich run? 43 miles per hour. Uh, this query doesn't even make sense. Ostrich sound calm. And it shows you a bunch of animals and then the sounds that they make classified as kind of a, an onomatopoeia, actually. Um, what sound? So, so ostriches have a lot of names for the sound that they make. They chirp, they bark, they hiss, they low, uh, they hum. Uh, that's an answer. Uh, how tall is an ostrich? And it gives you male and female. How to hatch an ostrich egg? This is a weird one because it's a link to a YouTube video, but it doesn't actually preview any of the video. And also, who is searching for this? This is kind of weird. Um, but how long do ostriches live? Around 40 years. That's a pretty good one. And we also have the, the related search in, searches inclusions happening at the bottom. So featured snippets, people also ask, those are at the top, but at the bottom we have related searches and these are also full of featured snippets searches. And you can see these are featured snippets too. When you expand them, they give you another answer that's not linking you over to a web page or even a new search. It's giving you the answer right there. And this makes sense if you think about what Google wants to do because Google cares very much about voice and Google has doubled down with their investment in voice search. And in voice search, you can't just show someone a list of websites for them to click on. You need the answers. They have to get it right on the first try or at least be able to disambiguate and narrow down the query to help you find the answer that you're looking for. And so answers are where Google is putting its effort because they can speak them. And that gets us to an important entity first indexing concept that I've been talking about on Twitter and writing about, and that is Fraggles. Fraggles is a word that I made up, at least from the SEO perspective. I borrowed it from Jim Henson. SEO, what we're talking about here is the combination of a fragment and a handle. And so what we're seeing is that Google is taking pieces of content that it might otherwise show in a featured snippet and linking to it as if there was a handle or a jump link or a bookmark on that content. And they're showing the fragment in a search result, kind of like a featured snippet, but then they're linking and scrolling directly to that fragment uh, from the search result. So that's where we get frandle, uh, fraggles. The interesting thing here is sometimes fraggles happen on existing handles, like in Wikipedia, uh, but often or occasionally, depending on how Google's feeling and what's what's happening in the algorithm, uh, the Fraggles happen without the handle having to be there in the code. Google is actually overlaying the handle or the jump link on, on an existing page, even though it wasn't there. And it's finding the content and scrolling directly to it on its own. So let's see what that looks like. So birds of New Zealand, uh, you can see here, we have uh, birds of New Zealand, Paid. We have a carousel at the top. When we click here on the Department of Conservation, uh, we have, oh, we have the answer carousel here, and then we click on Wikipedia. And what happens is it'll scroll directly to that part of the page. Now, sometimes it's just going to show the heading. Sometimes it's going to show the heading with a little bit of text or even with an image. But what you have to understand is that this can happen with or without the jump link being in the code. Now, I couldn't find a good example of it happening uh, without the jump link in the code for ostriches. Uh, so you have to forgive me there. Uh, but just trust me that we have seen uh, examples of this happening on content other than ostrich content, where there wasn't a jump link already there. Wikipedia, of course, it is. 
So we're also seeing different kinds of fraggles. There's that kind of fraggle, kind of a traditional fraggle that's on text, but we're also seeing video fraggles. And in this, you can see where it says on the right side, suggested clip. It's actually time constrained this video to answer my question. So the question is best way to eat ostrich. And it's saying, if you go straight, if you click this, we're gonna scroll you straight into one minute and two seconds of this video, because that's what really answers your question. Uh, we're also seeing audio fraggles, not a lot, but what we are seeing is uh, pronunciation audio fraggles, where it'll play the audio directly in the search result. How do you pronounce ostrich in German? Um, or these animal sounds, and, and I've shown these a couple times. Uh, they don't have an ostrich in here, but this is the closest we can get to audio, audio fraggles. But remember that Google has doubled down on podcasting in the past year. They're really saying they care a lot about podcasting. They're trying to double the number of podcasts that are available for people to consume. And we also know from Google I.O. that they're able to parse the audio out of a podcast to say speaker one, speaker two. And they're also allow, uh, able to transcribe it into text. So if they can speaker one, speaker two and transcribe it into text, then there's no reason that those won't eventually rank as uh, audio fraggles, especially considering that many podcasts are in the question answer format. Uh, and then you'll have the original speaker speaking the answer, and they'll just have to attribute the podcast to a speaker, things like that. So that's cool, and I expect that to start happening uh, at some point soon. But then we also see um, indications of fraggles in other things, like the AMP highlighting for featured snippets. So what happens here is if you have a featured snippet that is from an AMP page, um, when the featured snippet shows on the left, and it says, uh, Feathers were its four largest export behind fourth largest export behind gold and diamonds, and ostrich feathers were the most profitable. And you look over on the right, and it has that piece highlighted in orange. Now, what you can't see in this example is when you click on this featured snippet, it scrolls to this specific part of the page and shows you the highlighting. But the link to this particular part of the page and the highlighting are not anywhere in the code. Google has added this and done it of its own volition. The other thing you can see is that it's done of its own volition is it's tied two sentences together and cut out middle sentences that it didn't think answered the question well enough. And then they can remix stuff like this, like in the AMP stories, and this is a Steve Irwin AMP story, click on the story from the knowledge graph, what happens is it's taking pictures and clips of fragments of text and weaving it together in this immersive story experience that's all about Steve Irwin. And then you can even link to this Steve Irwin story as if it was a web page or something like that. But it's not a web page. It's just something that Google created with machine learning. And uh, they created it by doing by taking and lifting and remixing AMP content. So let's just look at it one more time in case you miss it. Life and career highlights of Steve Irwin. Start the story. Now, if you watch along the bottom, you will see that sometimes, sometimes they're giving credit to where the quotes came from, from the AMP, original AMP pages. But from that kind of experience, it's hard to believe that those pages will get loads of traffic. Um, so, so this is interesting. This is Google borrowing information from AMP to remix it into something better. Good for users, maybe not great for you as a web page. But then the other thing to know is that Google's already announced that Chrome users are going to be able to share links to specific words on a website. Because what Google found out was that users wanted to share a specific piece of a web page with their friends and the control F Function number one isn't known by you know people who aren't geeks, but number two is even harder to find on a phone. And so say you have to do things like say we'll scroll halfway down or scroll to the fifth paragraph or whatever. And that was a really bad experience. So Google is now letting you generate a link to a specific piece or part of a page, which again is basically the exact thing that we're seeing in the fraggles. And so we started seeing fraggles before Google announced this, but we think, you know, the fact that Google is now going to release this to users reinforces what we're seeing, that this is a new method that Google is using to understand the location of content on the web or to organize the location of 
um, things, I think, in their own index. Because if you think about how fraggles work, um, these are entity, these help with entity first indexing, because you might have a long page about ostriches. And you might have some content that is just about generic ostriches, but then you have subsections about specific kinds of ostriches. And if Google has a knowledge graph for general ostriches, which they do, um, they might want to take this piece and organize it there. But there are the specific ostriches that we saw in the carousel that they also have knowledge graph information for. And so they might want to take, if you have paragraphs about that specific ostrich, they might want to take that piece of the page and index it to a different piece of the knowledge graph. So fraggles are what enable Google to re-understand the web in a more intricate, useful way and organize one page, content from one page to many aspects of the knowledge graph. And that's a big deal. That's fundamentally a shift in how Google works. Uh, but the thing is, all of those featured snippets, all of those hosted inclusions are not showing up in your analytics and your analytics aren't going to tell you that you've got fraggles or carousels or the expanders for the answers. Those things you aren't going to get a lot of information on unless you're actually doing searches to see what they look like. And so Rand has talked about this and blogged about this with the data from JumpTap. Um, and I think this illustrates it really well. What this graph shows is that um, the number of zero-click search results in mobile is up. And it's about 61.5% of mobile searches result in no-click, uh, according to Rand uh, and according to JumpTap. So no clicks. And uh, so that's a lot, a large portion. So we know that more than half of uh, searches are mobile, but then more than half of those mobile searches aren't generating a click at all. So that's troubling because what it means is that 61.5% of the mobile search data isn't in your analytics at all, especially if you're just using Google Analytics and not looking at uh, search console. It's just not there because analytics and like Omniture, all of those things, they start with the click through to the website. So they're not measuring what's not generating clicks at all. But the thing is, you might have rankings, you might have even um, some other kind of presence in the results, but since it's not generating a click, it's not showing up in your analytics at all. So what that means is that mobile SEO decisions are going to be based on only 38.5% of the data. So saying and swearing that you're a data-driven SEO or data-driven marketer, but then not looking at the real reality of what's in a search result doesn't look so good anymore, right? Because you're making your decisions on such a very, very small percent of the data. And yes, data is good. Data is great. But it needs to be informed with more than just data, more than just numbers. And what I tend to believe about this data is that it's also not quite representative of reality because it says no click searches. But I think what it means is no website click searches because I think people are staying in the Google universe, the hosted inclusions, the featured snippets that people also ask. They're just not clicking through to a website. So I rewrite this in my mind as no website clicks. So the other thing that we're seeing as we look at the changes happening since mobile first indexing launched is that Google and users love hosted inclusions. And so we expect these hosted inclusions answer format results to grow and increase. Because the hosted inclusions are just more interesting than blue links. If you watch on the right, what you'll see is at the top, we have all of these gorgeous pictures. Let's do it. We have these pictures and carousels. We have the ability to drill down and expand. But then when you get below that stuff, except for the Pinterest carousel, things are really boring. Um, and so the 
answers, featured snippets, hosted inclusions are just more interesting than blue links. And when you get out of those, it feels like you're in the desert and you want to scroll back. You want to go back to the rich interactive content. And that's not just you, that's users. And think about users who are not SEOs. They want the answer fast. They're not hunting and pecking for websites. They just want the answer. It's rare that a user who's not very technical will say, oh, but what I really wanted was to read an entire website or to look through, look deep into a website. I didn't actually want that answer. I wanted the website. It's just rare. So uh, there is some data that backs this up, and Rand wrote about this as well. Um, so in the EU, there was a lawsuit, and what happened was the news companies got together uh, and said, this is a copyright infringement when Google lifts our images, titles, and featured snippets and shows them in the top, uh, top stories carousel. People are getting too much information from Google in this carousel, and so um, we don't like it. So they tried to sue Google. So that's not actually a mistake or a loading problem right there. That actually was how the results looked because Google was like, OK, we'll stop doing that. Um, so what happened? Traffic dropped 45 percent. Traffic to these news outlets that were worried about copyright infringement dropped 45 percent when Google stopped including the richness, the, the featured snippets or the 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 images and the um, cuts and summaries from the articles and the titles. Um, people just weren't willing to click. So what this shows us is people really like clicking on these things. They love clicking actually on pictures. People's fingers are drawn to click on pictures and color. So as SEOs, we need to start thinking more like Google and able to predict what they're going to do. And so you have to start pretending that you're a search engine making decisions about not just what SEOs want, but what users want too. Um, and so think about things that Google's been um, releasing uh, and not promoting heavily, especially to the SEO community, but Google released an indexing API that gets your pages in or out of their index in 24 hours. Uh, and David Sotomayor and Richard Baxter both wrote about this. Uh, and they're continuing to do more research on it. So watch the, these Twitter accounts for information there. But Google doesn't want to crawl the web anymore, or at least that's what I believe. Because the web, as, as the web has gotten bigger and bigger, the cost of crawling the web has increased, but the cost of hosting has gone down. What Google would rather do is either host things like the hosted inclusion and the knowledge graph, or they would rather ingest it through an API so they don't have to crawl randomly. Because that's what their crawler used to do. It would crawl and look at pages and look for changes, but didn't even know when it hit a page until it had crawled it if it changed. With APIs, it knows when it changes. And with hosting stuff, it knows when it changes because it's the host. It sees the change. So it can recrawl it immediately. But sending spiders out to sporadically crawl the entire web has gotten less scalable, less useful, less efficient than it was when the web was much smaller. So start to think about XML and schema as APIs for Google. These are things that make Google's job when it has to crawl much easier because it can find and highlight exactly what it needs and skip the rest or at least pay less attention to the rest. Um, and we also think about um, Google My Business, AMP, and the Google News APIs. These are also ways where you can give your information directly to Google and they can just ingest it. And that's great. Um, so next, you can think of PLAs from Merchant Center uh, and the new free version of PLAs from Merchant Center are all just from an XML file. And you can see these are really powerful rankings. On the right, we have a ranking for a step tracker. And you can see all of these pedometers ranking in a carousel. This is all because of an XML feed. And just think if you were the website that ranked right under this app tech app tracker um, app pack uh, and you were in position one, you're still in position one. Uh, but all of these uh, product listings are showing up above you. And again, this is from an XML file. Google, I think this shows, Google just wants to ingest your well-marked up data. It doesn't want to blindly crawl the web anymore. 
uh, but they're being actually so aggressive that sometimes they're getting things wrong and they're adding it to the knowledge graph. So in this one, it's, uh, this query is how long can an ostrich run? And the answer is 50 to 75 years. So the problem here is that since Google's being aggressive, they use the word long uh, as a trigger for a time kind of query. So it assumes that if I search for ostrich and long, it's I'm searching for how long do an ostrich does, does an ostrich live? If I had searched for how far can an ostrich run, I might have gotten a better result, but perhaps a knowledge graph doesn't have the, the length of time that an ostrich can run without stopping, and so they show this wrong result. So anything that Google hosts or ingests as a feed seems to have a ranking advantage. Think about that step tracker product listing, right? They didn't particularly do any SEO. They just submitted a feed and then all of a sudden it's right below the app pack for step trackers, right? It's at the top. And if you were in position one organic, you still are. You're just below this really great, rich, interactive carousel experience that gives you all the information that you need to make the website experience less appealing, less necessary. And the other thing is when Google hosts all this information, it's much easier for them to speak it uh, or give it as a result in a Google Home or a Google Assistant. And they can do it uh, potentially in other languages. When they host it, they can translate it. Uh, Remember, this, this goes back to the idea that the knowledge graph is language agnostic. When you have entity-first indexing, it's based on ideas or concepts that keywords and languages describe. And so that's why the knowledge graph is based on entity IDs that are numeric, because those are also language agnostic. Think back to like the movie Contact. Oh, they're speaking in math because it's the international language or, or what have you, intergalactic language. Uh, but numbers don't, don't adhere to one language or another. They're also language agnostic. So it makes sense that the knowledge graph uh, would be built around numeric entity IDs rather than a word or concept written in a particular language. And we actually see this play out when we do searches because what we found is that knowledge graph is treated differently than the rest of the search results. So if we're searching like we're from the, the U.S. in Anchorage, Alaska, and we search for ostrich, but we're in Alaska, but we change the, the search language or the phone language to Hindi. What happens? Well, the search still shows up in English because we searched for it in English. But knowledge graph comes back in Hindi. And we scroll down. Web results are in English, but the headings are still in Hindi. So Google's trying to adapt to the user preferences. Uh, they're set that say, I, I want to search in Hindi. And you can see at the bottom of each listing, there's the same bit of Hindi uh, right here that says, do you want to translate this result to English? I'm going to show you one more time as a, a bit of a zoom in case that one was too hard to see. We search in English. Knowledge graph comes back in Hindi because we set the phone language to Hindi. The, the Google headings and stuff like that, they're all in Hindi. Uh, but the query, since it's in English, returns English web links. And then you can see that the characters at the end of the text in the meta description are always the same. Just check out um, the first or the last character and you can see it's always the same. And what it's asking is, do you want to, or it's asking, do you want to translate this result into Hindi? So the reason Google can do this is because they're using the Cloud Natural Language API. So the Cloud Natural Language API is what allows Google to understand one set of text in a bunch of different languages at a time and break it down into its component entities. So it can tell you this is a person, this is a place, this is a thing, this is other. And there are a lot of others in this example. But it can also tell you the parts of speech and syntax. Um, so it can tell you what's a noun, what's a verb, and what adjectives describe that noun. 
and then it can tell you categories. And this is where you find find out if anything in here is classified as a specific entity or entity grouping. And so this is a great tool to use to evaluate the text on your website, make sure Google is understanding it correctly. For instance, if we had written something about how long can an ostrich run, um, we might consider changing it to how far can an ostrich run, or um, at least doing a better job of marking up things as time versus distance uh, so that Google understands the question and gets the answer right. So let's look at another case study. So we already had the panic room for the ostrich that was scared, but what if the ostrich decides to run? He might want running shoes. He might want running shoes. So we wanted to uh, look at um, the best running shoes and see how are people approaching queries about running shoes and how might that impact a client like uh, hypothetically Nike. So in this, what you can see is we have another found on the web. We have a lot of uh, related people also search for kinds of queries. We have a lot of uh, people also ask kinds of results that are showing up in the search result. But that found on the web is really telling because it was pushing a lot of uh, top ranking websites for this uh, query, websites that tried really hard to rank for best running shoes, pushing them way down. So. We saw here, for instance, that with found on the web in Nike, what we get when we click through is a carousel of uh, pages, but the pages aren't from the Nike website. They're from uh, like roundups, runner's world, run repeat. They're reviews of like third party reviews of, of Nike shoes. And right now we see these carousels as going to different pages, but I think in the future they may also be carousels of fraggles that go to just to different parts of a page, for instance, in one of these roundup posts potentially. So we did the search um, and put it into a spreadsheet, same as the last time. We used four addresses and five keywords. We did iOS and Android and color coded it, same as the last time. But then we also wanted to look uh, for Launch of a store in Sydney. So we did um, a service area search in the Mobile Moxie tools where we said, okay, here's, here's where we're looking at launching a new store. When we just search for a brand, the brand, Nike, what is happening? Okay, so we have a lot of paid up there. We have a pretty good organic result right there. And then we have a couple Nike stores. We have inconsistent naming conventions. Uh, maybe that's good. Maybe that's intentional. Maybe it's not. But what we found when we clicked around is that some areas of the city were more competitive than others. Uh, and some areas of the city had a lot more going on uh, in the map pack and as well as above and below than others. And so again, we, we took this and plotted it out and looked at where are the strong map pack results, where the weak map pack results, and where are the other things that are getting in the way of a potential uh, new store ranking well in the map pack. And we put that into a spreadsheet as well. And so we looked at the star rating in GMB. Is the image useful? Is the map correct, of course? Uh, is the map Nike only? Or are there stores that just sell Nike shoes uh, but are not Nike brand in it? Uh, stuff like that. And then uh, uh, shared this findings uh, with the client. So there's something else that, that became apparent when we were doing that research, and that is that paid is getting super compelling. Um, and we have all these different kinds of paid results that are starting to show up that aren't just uh, the text links at the top. They're not even call links or anything like that. We're getting these really rich uh, image clusters as part of PLAs or brand clusters that you see at the top here, but also the full-size slideshows that you see for Adidas. Um, in the in the second result below. And these are both sponsored, but they're way more compelling than old sponsored results used to be. And again, this is just a generic query for running shoot, which companies uh, like Nike used to compete like crazy for uh, to rank number one. But if you're competing with these huge slideshow images and the, the PLA carousels up at the top, uh, those are going to take more and more traffic. And that is, of course, exactly what Google wants and what Google planned. Uh, this data, uh, also written up by Rand and from Jumpshot, shows the increase in mobile paid CTR. And you can see that um, 
in May 2017, it began to surpass desktop, the click-through rate. Um, and you can see that it got as high as 9.8%, but leveled out at about 8.7%. But this also impacts your organic search results or your organic traffic, because if people are clicking through to a paid result, they may show up in your Google Analytics, but they'll show up as paid. And when you have those rich PPC style results showing above, up above your organic, they're going to drive more clicks than a traditional PPC text result. And so you need to know when those have started coming into the queries that you're targeting for organic because they're just going to get more clicks. So there's some data out there by WordStream that shows the average uh, CTR and average conversion rate within specific PPC categories. Um, and so that's a good place to start when you're figuring out how much PPC may or may not be taking traffic or growing um, in your uh, in your industry, but remember that they're growing much faster in mobile than they are in desktop. So what to do about this? Let's bring it all together. Uh, the problem with all of this great theory is that your boss still wants to see traffic growth, and that's tough. <clears throat> but sometimes, frankly, bosses struggle with reality. You can think about the recording industry, the newspaper industry, and cable TV. All of these bosses also wanted to continue to see general growth, but the industries almost went away, right? No one's buying CDs, they stream music. Uh, newspaper subscription, subscriptions are way down, people are getting their news on the internet. Uh, cable cutters are meaning that people aren't signing up for cable subscriptions like they used to, and bosses can want and want and want to see growth, but it may just not be possible. And so to give people that kind of bad news, you're gonna need, first off, possibly free hugs. But then also that, you're going to need to consider the math. So you need to look, did the keywords that you're targeting just drop off in general in Google Trends, right? Are people still searching for what we're selling and for the keywords that we're targeting? Because if you've been doing SEO for a long time, you may be targeting words that people aren't searching for anymore, uh, or they're just searching for a lot less and there's a new word. So you need to look at overall search volumes, at least industry-wide or category-wide with your generic keywords in Google Trends to say, hey, the overall demand for this kind of content might just be down. But then next, is the traffic a uh, drop attributable to a decrease in mobile click-through uh, because of more featured snippets, more answers, more carousels, more stuff like that, or attributable to an increase in paid click-through rate because you've got those beautiful PPC carousels or full-size ads and images with slides. Could could that be part of it? And And then try and quantify that. And then the last, did the average number or size of featured snippets increase, right? Are we seeing not just stuff at the top that's pushing everyone down, but total number of featured snippets like people also ask and uh, found on the web and interesting finds? Are those things crowding out and looking better than the traditional web results? So you've got to find ways to capture that and guess what percent of traffic loss might be attributable to that. Uh, the problem that we find is that people still don't know uh, from day to day what a mobile search result looks like. And so that's why at Mobile Moxie, we have our tools and we can set them to run the same query uh, over time. So we can say, run this big query that we care about um, in these 20 or 30 locations and run that weekly because we want to see change over time and see if something new is all of a sudden showing up in a search result where we used to rank number one or where we used to drive a lot of traffic. And so this is a good way to kind of protect yourself and to back up your data because when you're showing data and you're showing drops and you say, well, the mobile result doesn't look the same as it used to, uh, the bosses, the people that you report to, they're going to be skeptical. And the best way is just to show them a picture because they'll see that you still rank number one, but it's driving less traffic, but they won't be able to really understand why. And until you say, look, on this date, it looked like this. And on this date where the drop is, it started to look like this. And so that's why uh, we, we put so much time into to making the tools capture, capture actual location-specific, phone-specific uh, results so that we would not be caught in that situation where we couldn't explain a drop in mobile traffic um, that didn't 
that wasn't attributable to a drop in numeric rankings per se. So the other things you can do, work really hard to get into the knowledge graph. Uh, this is with schema. This is um, knowing what's in the knowledge graph. And so a good place to start to know what's in the knowledge graph that's related to your industry is this tool, search the knowledge graph. Um, Dot com and you just put in your query or your topic and it'll show you the, the entity IDs for all the stuff that's already in the knowledge graph that's related to that topic. And so if you put in your query and it doesn't come back with anything, um, you can try and go more broad. But knowing what's already in the knowledge graph gives you a place to start to say, hey, we're related to this thing that's already in the knowledge graph. So we need to make it more clear to Google that we're related to that thing so that we can also get into the knowledge graph. You can also look at this through uh, Google's Knowledge Graph API. You can see on the right, um, there are a bunch of, of uh, things that you can fill in. Just leave those and change where it says query. That's the one that you really care about. And when you hit return, it'll give you the same kind of information, all of the Knowledge Graph things related to this. Uh, and you can build out from there. And then last is to use the Market Finder tool on your website to see how Google has you classified. Now, this came out just before the launch of Mobile First Index, saying you can see it's got apps and websites. Um, and what's interesting here is it was marketed to the paid side of the house, to the PPC experts. But when you put your URL in, um, it just goes do do do, and it tries to tell you. Um, very quickly what your site's about. So you have to click I accept and then go and it goes do, do, do. This website is about food, backpacking, camping food, car emergency kits and supplies, in injury and wound care. Uh, so that's pretty good. It's But what's important here is, number one, it's giving you the market for these kinds of topics in other countries. Which again, gets us back to this language agnostic concept. Like These concepts are universal. Uh, but also, look again at how quickly it figured that out. It wasn't actually crawling the website when you put the URL in. It was retrieving it from the database. What this tells me this this level of quickness that it comes back uh, with the results is that it's not telling you what it determines your site is about is at the time it's telling you about what your site has already been classified for uh, in Google's index so I think part of mobile first indexing was Google doing this kind of classification exercise to say we think these these websites roughly fit into these Kind of five categories and so you can put your website into this tool and see how are you categorized and if you look really hard and you dig into this tool there are places to suggest new categories to help google potentially build out the knowledge graph of course they didn't market this to seos we might have used it but now you know about it you can look in here see the whole breakdown of how they understand categories and subcategories and those relationships. But then if you drill down far enough, uh, there's the ability to suggest new categories. So the last thing is we need to reconsider what is and is not SEO because some people say might say that if I'm not trying to rank a web page, I'm trying to just get my branded data into the knowledge graph, that's not SEO. But I Totally disagree. I think we need to keep up with where Google is going as SEOs. Um, if Google is going towards answers and going towards knowledge graph, we need to do that. So let's look at some of the old SEO basics. These are still true. You want strong headlines, strong, strong subheadings and heading tags. You want schema, hreflang. You want good alt text and you want uh, lots of linked up related content. But let's look at the new stuff now. You need to optimize for hosted inclusions, and that includes optimizing your Google My Business listing and Google Posts. That includes sending your products in a Google Merchant Center XML feed. That includes adding audio, video, and image assets that are well marked up and well SEOed so that they can become audio, video fraggles, or so that they can be images that are shown in a featured snippet, hybrid featured snippet. Uh, and then you need to do feature, uh, speakable schema. Uh, speakable schema is the way Google knows what can be spoken and what can't um, as an answer. And right now, it's it's all about FAQ, Q&A, and how to. So if you have that content, it needs to be wrapped in speakable schema. But potentially, there will be more things that are going to be added uh, for speakable schema markup. So watch that space. But whatever you do, 
find the content that you have or make new content for those three things, FAQ, uh, Q&A, and how to, and put, put it in speakable schema so that it can start to rank as an audio answer. And um, last thing, since you sat through the whole uh, recording of this speech, we're giving you a free promo code uh, for one month free in our tools so that you can try them out uh, and see if they work well for you. Um, this is one month all access and includes all, all the tools that we showed you um, uh, and uh, an ASO tool as well. Just use this webinar 003 code um, and you'll be set to jet. Thanks for listening. Uh, talk to you later.